Here we are, a new series that we're beginning uh, entitled Getting to Know You, God, Getting to Know You, God. And this is the uh, first uh, lesson in this uh, short series that we're doing entitled, Is God a He, a She, or an It? And uh, I do mention at the beginning of this series, uh, I want to recommend a great book that has a lot of uh, this material in it, a lot of uh, good reference material uh, entitled One Holy Hunger by Mike Cope, a great book uh, that gives a lot of insight and information about knowing God more deeply and uh, personally. Okay, let me ask a, a question to uh, start our lesson with. Uh, when you're by yourself and you're praying to God, do you really know who you're praying to? You know, are you even sure that someone is there? I've had people say that to me you know, when their faith is weak at times or people who are new Christians or people who are not even Christians. You know, they're saying, well, when I'm praying, you know, I, I, I'm not even sure that somebody's listening to me. Uh, do you find that uh, you're doing all the talking and when you stop, there's a kind of a dead silence there? Wouldn't it be nice if, if, if God would say, OK, I hear you, keep talking, you know, but you don't hear that. Some people, that, that disturbs them, the idea that they're you know, praying to God and then there's just silence, they don't hear anything. They have to, by faith, uh, understand that uh, He's hearing them and He understands what they're saying. Uh, some people think that um, they're just talking to themselves. I've heard people say that even about prayer, all prayer, you know, that's just you talking to yourself or talking to somebody you hope that's there. Well, of course, uh, we know that children don't have these types of faith issues about knowing if God is there or not. They don't have this problem when they pray because their faith is so simple, it's so straightforward uh, that they don't have these kinds of doubts. I, I would imagine this is one of the reasons why Jesus said that our faith has to be like, like children. We have to become like children, not immature like small children, but immature and evil, of course, but also uh, simple in our faith and our trust that God is there and He here. Uh, there, have been a, there have been some books published uh, that provide examples of children's prayer that demonstrate how simple they are and how, uh, how uh, basic their trust in that God is, uh, is really listening. And uh, so this uh, fellow published a book of, of, of prayers that were sent in by, uh, by parents. So I have a couple here. One of them says this, Dear God, thank you for my baby brother, but what I prayed for was a puppy. Signed, Joyce. Uh, another great example of a child's prayer, Dear God, I would like to know why all the things you said are printed in red. Signed, Joanne. Uh, one more, it says, Dear God, Maybe Cain and Abel would not kill each other so much if they had their own rooms. It works for me and my brother. <laughs> Signed, Larry. So uh, a couple of uh, examples of uh, children and their, their simple trust in God, knowing that He's there and He's uh, listening to what they say. Uh, because children see God as Father and they see Him as good and they're content to approach Him in a simple and confident manner. So it's sad that as we grow older, and here's my point, it's sad that as we grow older, our view of God changes and we begin to have false ideas about Him. And those false ideas about Him uh, interfere, well, among other things, interfere with our, with our prayer life. So in this, um, uh, and the next few lessons that I'm going to uh, do, uh, I want us to kind of get a grip on you know, who God really is. In other words, I want us to have a better understanding of who He is and what He desires from us. Uh, hence the title, Getting to Know You, God. Hopefully, we're going to be able to destroy false images that we have of Him and know Him more for who He uh, really is. So if we succeed, it'll accomplish a couple of things for us. First of all, we will uh, increase our personal joy and peace because knowing God better is the essence of the experience of eternal life. What did, what did Jesus say? Uh, and this is eternal life, that you shall know God and His Son, uh, Jesus Christ, John uh, 17, 3. Uh, the idea that eternal life, the experience of eternal life, 
is the ongoing process of knowing God intimately. And we don't have to wait till we get to heaven to begin that process. We begin that process here on earth. Also, if we get to know God better, we will have greater confidence in facing death and, and all of the complications and difficulties that surround dying. The more I know my God, the less I am afraid of what the world can do to me. Um, if we read in Romans uh, chapter eight, uh, what Paul says, uh, that this type of confidence that he has, and he writes with this type of confidence because Paul was a man who knew God intimately. So he writes in uh, Romans chapter eight, uh, verse 38 and 39, he says, for I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Uh, this is a, a man who has a lot of confidence uh, in God, a man who truly knows God, and because of that can write uh, these type of words. Um, to, those who, um, to those who are many times uh, fearing death, to those who don't know God very well. Uh, so we have to you know, get to know God more inti intimately to have this kind of, of confidence. And then one other thing uh, in knowing God more perfectly, uh, we, will have more effect we will have a more effective prayer life. Um, as, a, uh, as we grow in the knowledge of the one that we pray to, our boldness in prayer will increase and our faith uh, that He hears and responds will increase as well. And, and the outcome will increase, right? What does James say? You know, the prayer offered in faith will restore the one who is sick. James chapter 5, verse 15. A strong faith is required for strong results. And so the way to build faith is to get to know God more perfectly the God of the Bible. So the prayer in faith is the prayer offered in belief that God is there and that God hears and God is able to answer and has answered uh, in the past. And this faith comes as we grow in our knowledge of the one that we pray to. All right, one of the more uh, recent questions about God and who He is uh, is the following. Is God a he or a she or an it? I don't think we ask that question here. I know, I know I'm kind of preaching to the faithful uh, you know, today, but uh, this is a question that comes up with individuals who are not as familiar with the, uh, with the Bible as perhaps this uh, particular class is familiar. Um, we know that recently there have been efforts to eliminate all the gender related references to God in the Bible. Um, this was a reaction to the seemingly patriarchal nature of the Bible and male-dominated imagery. Some feminists, another group, went even as far as to suggest that we should refer to God as a she in order to redress the imbalance of the last 2,000 years. And so you have Bibles that don't refer to God as a he, refer to God as an it or to a power or to a, you know, or even they, they, they mix it. Sometimes they refer to God as he, and sometimes they refer to God as she, sometimes uh, use the, the term mother God, father God, you know, to try to blend together a uh, you know, homogeneous God that, 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 that includes maleness and femaleness and so on and so forth. Of course, this is politically correct thinking, and this politically correct posturing doesn't take into account uh, that references to God in the Bible are, are metaphors. I mean, they refer to uh, Peter as he, that's not a metaphor. Uh, the Bible refers to Peter as he because Peter was a man. Uh, but when the Bible refers to God as he, that's a metaphor. So whether they're male or female references makes no difference, they're still metaphors that only describe through imagery part of God's character. So the simple truth is that God is neither male nor female. God is pure spirit and is thus 
not human, let alone man-human or woman-human. You know, in John 4, 24, it says God is spirit. Jesus Himself says this, God is spirit. And therein lies the problem of knowing God. You see, if, um, if He were human, uh, well then we could, we could more easily relate to Him. But because His nature is completely different from ours, we have difficulty in knowing Him. You know, the Greeks, they had their gods, they had their panoply of gods, but their gods were like half human and half divine. You know, they had human characteristics, they wept, they were jealous, they got married, they cheated, you know, that type of thing. But the God of the Bible is, is not human in any way. And so uh, you know, we can't attribute to the God of the Bible uh, human characteristics. It doesn't, it, he's, he, he's not like us. We, we may be like Him in many ways, but He's not like us. You, you see what I'm saying? So because we have this problem in relating to a spirit that is completely different than ourselves, God solves this problem by revealing Himself in terms and images that are taken from our frame of reference and not His frame of reference, or not exclusively His frame of reference. For example, it wouldn't help us to know God you know, more deeply if He said, well, in many ways He's like the angels. What if that's the only information we had about God? Well, if you want to know what God, what God is like, well, He's like the angels. Well, angels are spirits also, but they're different in many ways from God. However, we can't relate to angels either because they're spirit beings and we're human beings. And so using them and only them as a reference would not be very helpful to us. So what God does is He selects people and things that belong to our world and our nature to try and describe what exists in another world, in another dimension, in another nature. Okay? Now the danger for man has always been that he worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator. That's what Paul says in Romans chapter 1, verse 25. So we have to be careful of that. In other words, man has made a God out of the things that represent or give us insight into God's nature. So in today's society, we are doing the reverse. We're trying to eliminate or replace these things or images that the Bible uses to describe God and we're replacing them or trying to replace them with symbols that suit us better or fulfill our political or humanistic agenda. In other words, we're not using what the Bible gives us to describe God. We, not we, you and I, but you know, in the world, we're trying to do away with these type of symbols and metaphors and we want to use our own symbols and metaphors to describe God so that He'll fit more with you know, my politically correct thinking. So I'm going to call God a she half the time and then I'm going to call God a he half the time, contrary to what the Bible does. Because calling God a he half the time and calling Him a she half the time that fits more with my thinking about fairness between the sexes. You see, what I, you see what I'm saying? The answer, of course, is to realize that God, He's the one that not only chose to reveal Himself to man, but also the manner in which He would do so. So let's uh, read Hebrews 1, verses 1 and 2, and uh, Think of this, these verses now in the context of what we're talking about this morning. So it says, God, after He spoke long ago to the fathers in the prophets and in many portions and in many ways. So let's stop there for a second, right? So what is the Hebrew writer saying? That God did reveal Himself, spoke to the fathers. Who are the fathers? You know, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, these people, you know, the, 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 the fathers. And He spoke to the prophets but it says in many portions and in many ways. He revealed Himself in a variety of ways, to Moses in the burning bush, to Isaiah, you know, the voice, uh, uh, the inspiration, uh, 
uh, to others with images, to the Israelites, you know, fire, thunder, lightning on the mountain. You know, he revealed himself in the ways that he chose to reveal himself to man, selecting the way and the manner and the portion that was suitable for the individuals of the time and suitable to the thing that he wanted to share with them. You know, when he reveals himself to Moses as the burning bush, as the bush you know, that's burning but doesn't burn away, if you know what I'm saying, trying to get across to Moses that he is the eternal one, I am, the bush that doesn't you know, burn up, always constant, that's the image, that's the, that's the way that he reveals himself to Moses, why? For the purpose of teaching Moses more about who he is. That's why he didn't reveal himself to Moses in a dream, so that Moses wouldn't be saying to himself, well, maybe that was just a dream. See what I'm saying? So God chooses the way to reveal himself to different individuals in order to teach them something about himself. So that's why many ways, many portions. So the writer says, in these last days, he has spoken to us in His Son, whom He appointed heir of all things, through whom also He made the world. So now, not through signs in the skies, not through you know, dividing the sea and so on and so forth. This is not how God has chosen to reveal Himself to us. Now, He says, in these last days, we're in the last days, right? He's chosen to reveal Himself through Jesus Christ. That's how He wants us to know Him through Jesus Christ, okay? So we don't have, a, the point I'm going to make here is this, we don't have a right to change even the images because the Bible says God is the one that chooses to reveal Himself in various ways, metaphors, miracles, Jesus Christ. He, he has a right to change the way that He reveals Himself for His own purposes, but we don't have a right to change the images and the ways. That's the point I'm, I'm making here. So from the burning bush in Moses' time to the person of Jesus in the New Testament, God has revealed Himself using many different forms. Our task is not to elevate one form over the other, but to bring all of these forms together so that we can better know the spirit we call God. Okay, that's how we get to know God. Let's look at the ways in the Bible. Let's look at the ways He's revealed Himself and see from the ways He's revealed Himself how we can better know Him. And that's what this short series is about. So let's talk about God as a thing. Um, remember we said, is it a he, a she, or an it? So let's start with the it. From the beginning, God has made a variety, of, or used rather, a variety of inanimate objects, its, if you wish, to demonstrate facets of His character. For example, in Exodus chapter 3, verse 2, as I mentioned before, a burning bush that, that was not destroyed. Why? Why this way to reveal Himself? Well, to demonstrate the internal and powerful nature of God to Moses. Because uh, you know, in Moses' ministry, God would eventually send him to do other great miracles. And so he begins by demonstrating his power, the burning bush. If God can be the burning bush, then God can divide the sea and so on and so forth. Okay? In Psalm 28, verse 7, it says, The Lord is my strength and my shield. Now here the Lord is depicted as a, a shield. In this and many other passages, God is seen as a shield to demonstrate His protective nature. In Deuteronomy 32.4, it says, the rock, His work is perfect. God, the metaphor for God here is as a stone, a rock, not, not a little throwing stone, but a rock, a boulder, right? A rock. What does that say about God? Well, God is stable, foundational, unmovable. Of course, these images have limitations, but within context they describe quite graphically certain dimensions of God so we can relate to Him viscerally, 
not just intellectually, but viscerally. I see the huge boulder, right? I see the huge rock. And I say, you know, God is my rock. I, I can feel the strength and the power of that if I tap on it, if I try to, I can't move it, right? So I can relate to this image here viscerally, emotionally. So this is one of the reasons that certain uh, metaphors use objects to describe, uh, to describe God. So knowing God you know, is not just the head knowledge, it's gut knowledge as well. And these images help us to know God from the, from the guts, from the inside. They help us to know Him emotionally as well as intellectually. And so a lot of the, and of course these metaphors, they have limitations, don't they? No one example, no one thing, no one metaphor can capture all of what God is. Impossible. Impossible. But they do give us you know, ideas, insights into parts of His character, parts of His personality and, and, and it's left to us. We have an intellect, we have a brain. It's up to us to kind of put these things together to begin to you know, make a, a, more complete, a more complete image. Okay, so that's God as a thing. Let's take a look at God as a woman. The idea that God is represented as female in the Bible is not unheard of. There are examples of it. So the idea of God as a woman makes people feel uncomfortable because the majority of references to God in the Bible speak of Him as male, but not exclusive. Not all of them refer to Him as male. There are many references in the Bible to God as a mother, for example. In Ezekiel chapter 19, verse two, uh, it says, or Ezekiel says, what was your mother? A lioness among lions. So here, God is compared to a fierce and protective lioness in giving birth to Israel. And so the imagery of God here is female, not male. In Isaiah 66, 7, it says, before she goes into labor, she gives birth. So here God compared to a human female at the point of giving birth. And it goes on to say in this passage that the child, Israel, was born, in other words, conceived and carried and delivered in a single day. You know, a kind of a superhuman woman, if you wish. But nevertheless, the imagery of God is female. In Matthew 23, verse 37, what does Jesus say in reference to the people and of Jerusalem? He says, how often I wanted to gather your children together the way a hen gathers her chicks under her wings. And so here, the protective nature of a hen is compared to God's protective nature towards His children. Again, the imagery of God here, female in nature. So the use of female imagery is used throughout the Bible to describe various aspects of God's character and nature. What better way to convey protectiveness and tenderness and compassion than through the figure of a woman and a mother. And so you know, be careful when you make arguments. Well, you know, you know, we, we can only refer to God as a man you know, because uh, it's blasphemy if we, no. No, no, the Bible has many images referring to God, not, not necessarily as a quote woman, but the feminine nature. You know how you say a man, you got to get in touch with your feminine side. And what's the feminine side? Usually when you talk about your own nature, men, you're talking about, well, that side that's more tender, more loving, you know what I'm saying? That's, usually that's the feminine side. Well, the Bible is talking about God's you know, uh, features of His character that reflect a more, uh, the feminine nature, if you will, and that's, that's fine. All right, let's talk about God as a man. <clears throat> Even though there are more metaphors in the Bible showing God as a man, we need to remember that this does not mean that He's human. Uh, never mind human, it does not prove or, or teach that, that God is a, a male human either. Because God is neither male nor female. He's a spirit. 
Now some say that this use of male imagery was done because men are the one who wrote the Bible and they were prejudiced. And this, of course, is, is not so. In, in 2 Peter uh, chapter 1, verse uh, 20, uh, Peter writes, no prophecy of scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation. In other words, um, it's, uh, and he goes on to say, but men moved by the Spirit, right? And so what's in the Bible is inspired, it's God breathed. God is the one that gave to those who wrote the Bible the information uh, to record. Uh, the images and the metaphor uh, they belong to God, not man. A man is not the one who decided, I'm never going to use, you know, I'm never going to use female imagery for God because I think God is more, is more like a man. No. Human beings did not make the decision as to what would be contained in the Bible. That's what Paul, oh, Paul that's what Peter is saying here. Men were moved by the Spirit. It's the Spirit of God that gave to men what they were to write. And when it comes to metaphors, whatever metaphor they used, whether it was an it, a she, or a he, this was given to man by the Spirit of God. Now some say that this use of male imagery was done because, as I say, men wrote it. But the images and the resources, excuse me, the images and the material come from God, not man. The major idea beginning in the Old Testament is that of God as Father, actually. And the term Father used in the Old Testament means chief or source or nourisher. In Hosea, uh, Hosea 11 verse 1 it says, Out of Egypt I called my son. Out of Egypt I called my son. There's the Father. The Jews referred to God as Father and Lord or Father and King but it was Jesus who developed the idea of God as dad or dad. In John, the Gospel of John, Jesus refers to God simply as father or parent over a hundred times. Paul the Apostle repeats this beautiful and comforting imagery in Romans 8, 15 to 17, where he refers to God as Abba or father or daddy, actually, a more intimate term. The metaphor of father suggests one who is chief, but also one who is provider and sustainer, leader, protector, comforter, teacher, friend. So God is not a, a man, but from the male nature, God has drawn some inherent characteristics in order to convey yet another aspect of His complex person for us to know and to draw comfort from. He's teaching us about Himself using us because we understand us. We understand us as males, us as females, and we also understand the it's in our, you know, in our surroundings. And so God uses all of these sources in order to help us relate to Him who is a pure spirit. So we can refer to God as a He not because God is male or not because God prefers males, but because Jesus chose to confirm the Old Testament reference to God as such and lay down for us a way of referring and interacting with God which was proper and accurate according to God's will. I mean, if Jesus refers to God as Father a hundred times, and never one time as mother, then I can feel quite comfortable in referring to God as father myself without feeling guilty or you know, uh, insensitive to my sisters in Christ's feelings. And faithful women of God can refer to God as father without feeling they're betraying their own sexuality. Why? Because their Lord and my Lord has referred to God as Father numerous times. and We can follow his, his lead. I can call God my Father because Jesus called God His Father. And this is why I don't refer to God as it or as she. I mean, as I've demonstrated, there are times where God is, uh, uses 
metaphors, you know, using objects to describe his character, using the female nature or women or mothers to describe part of his character. So it's not unheard of in the Bible that you know, God uses a variety of ways to, to, to describe Himself. But I base the way that I refer to God on the way that Jesus my Lord refers to God. And He refers to God as Father. And so I follow in His lead and I call God Father. This is the reason that I do it. This is the reason that we do it. This is the reason that the church has done it from the very beginning. Of course, the most complete revelation of God comes not through an image or a metaphor, but rather through a person. In Colossians uh, chapter, um, uh, chapter one, verse uh, 15, uh, P, uh, Paul writes, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. And so um, in Jesus Christ, uh, all the imagery of the Bible finds its expression in a person. So you know, all the, the it and he and she images in the Old Testament, all of these things come together in one person in the New Testament, in Jesus Christ. So the protectiveness of the lioness and the tenderness of a mother and the strength of a father and the solidity of a rock and so on and so forth, these and all other metaphors are now expressed completely in Jesus Christ. It is summarized in a male because a male was the first created and a male will be the one through whom the second creation comes. That's what Paul, uh, Paul says in Romans chapter 5, 19, he says, um, for as through the one man's disobedience the many were made sinners, even so through the obedience of the one the many will be made righteous. The first man, Adam, he's, he fell. And then the one like Adam, the first one that, will, that was resurrected, Jesus, he's the one that raises up those who fell because of Adam's sin. More importantly, the full nature of God is represented in human form because humans are made in the image and the likeness of God. Animals are not. Objects are not. And so we come back to the original, uh, the original question. Who are we praying to? A he, a she, an it, you know, who are we praying to? And the answer is, you are praying to someone who is not human but can relate to human need and human emotion because he took on a human nature and experienced life as we know it and then returned to the spiritual dimension and position from which he came. Okay. That's who God is. We see Him in Jesus. So what does this mean for me? Well, first of all, it means that God can relate to me. He can feel what I feel, and thus understand all of our concerns and joys and fears. We're not wasting our time expressing ourselves because He can relate. It's hard for us to relate to Him. He is so, so much more than we are. We cannot you know, take it all in. But He can relate to us because Jesus Christ took on the limiting nature of a human being, the limiting nature of a human being, and uh, experienced the limiting nature of a, human, of a human being unto death. So everything from our birth to our death that we raise up to Him in prayer, He can relate to because He was born and he ultimately died. And he can relate to every experience you know, between these two points in anyone's life. So I'm not wasting my time 
when I lay before him my problems about uh, finding a job or my sore back or my mother's sick or I have to bury my husband or wh wh whatever, whatever prayer goes up to him. He can relate to all these things. Secondly, it means that God do does care. His intimate involvement with man throughout history, even to the point of becoming human himself for a while, demonstrates that He does care and He does hear our prayer. Why would He do such a thing? <laughs> Why would He experience such a thing? Why would He change you know, uh, His nature to, to, to experience human living? Why would He do that if He didn't care? And so, uh, uh, it teaches us that we have a sympathetic and eager ear when we, when we pray. And then thirdly, it means that God wants to help. You know, the Bible shows how God is zealous for His people, how He is, you know, he is eager um, uh, for sinners to come back and, and anxious uh, to punish the evil ones especially those who hurt Christians. So we have hope that our prayers will be answered and not grudgingly. You see what I'm saying? God isn't there, you know, you're not there praying, oh God, please, please, and He's going, oh, you know, I don't feel like it. No, okay, fine, you can have it. You know, all right, I'll, send, I'll get you a new job. You know, that's, that's not God. I mean, the Bible says that God loves a cheerful giver, right? loves a cheerful giver. Have you ever stopped to think for a moment, if God loves a cheerful giver, it must mean that He Himself is a cheerful giver? <laughs> he loves when we're like that, why? Well, because that's how He is. He's not a cheapskate. He doesn't give grudgingly. He's not upset if we you know, prosper. He is a cheerful giver. He loves to give, He wants to give. He is anxious to give us things and has prepared incredibly marvelous and wonderful gifts for us in the spiritual dimension. So he's a cheerful giver and he wants to help. And so when we make our invitation, you know, you know, when we talk to people you know, during the sermons or different times, you know, we invite people to be baptized or be restored. Let's remember that this is the God that people are coming to when they come forward, you know, to confess their faith or to ask for restoration. They're not coming to a he or a she or an it, but a spirit. But a spirit who is able to understand as well as answer all of our prayers because he can relate and he does care and he does want to help. Okay, so that's the first lesson in our series, Getting to Know You, God. Hopefully answering the question, is God a he, a she, or an it? Well, he's, he's none of those things. He's a spirit, but he uses metaphors and images from he, she, and it in order to describe uh, his, uh, his nature. And we use the male pronoun, you know, the male he, in referring to God. Uh, because Jesus uses that He. He's given us that way to refer uh, to the Father, to God. All right? And not because God is a male, not because God loves males more than He loves women, but this is the way that uh, the Son, Jesus, you know, I mean, God could have sent, <laughs> think about it, God could have sent a woman. I mean, He could have chosen a woman to be the one, but He didn't. He chose uh, the Son to come as a, as a male. All right, and so we call God a he because Jesus called God a he and the Bible of course supports that idea all the way through. We use that metaphor and that imagery because that's the imagery that the Bible uh, gives us and the Bible uses that imagery because God is the one who gave that imagery to those who wrote the Bible because the Bible is inspired by God. Okay, just a little summary there of our first lesson. <clears throat> Excuse me, we'll move on with this. Uh, in the weeks to come. Thank you for your attention.